Hello to everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Thank you so much for joining us for this very important webinar. My name is Kirsty Howie, and I'm the Executive Director of the Environment Centre of the Northern Territory. And I'd like to just start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you uh, from, from Catherine, um, and this region uh, comprises the unceded lands and waters of the Jawan, Waterman and Duggerman people, and I acknowledge their sovereignty was never ceded and pay my respects to their careful custodianship of lands and waters here over many millennia. I also would like to acknowledge um, that I'm, I'm located next door to a room of amazing people who are traditional owners who have gathered from across the catchments of the Ropa and Daly systems, stretching down as far south as Elliot, as far east as Nooka, uh, and they are the real experts in the room and we're very delighted to have uh, have water experts joining us from interstate, but I'd just like to acknowledge the people in the room uh, next door to me who, who have cared for the Roper and Daly systems for so long. Uh, we're delighted to put on this webinar today, which is very, very important and very, very timely. As many of you will know, the rivers of the Northern Territory are truly a national treasure. They're free flowing, uh, are unimpeded by dams largely, and from excessive groundwater extraction, they have extraordinary natural and cultural values. And our view at the Environment Centre is that these rivers and the aquifers that discharge into them should be treasured and protected, not just by people here, but by people across Australia and indeed across the globe. Yet, at the moment, there are multiple pressures bearing down on the unique rivers of the Northern Territory. Of course, climate change is already having significant effects here. And we are really looking at existential threats to all life here with the potential of the Northern Territory and the top end becoming uninhabitable by as early as 2070. There are also new development pressures here, quite frankly, on a scale uh, not seen before in the Northern Territory. Uh, there are very, very big plans afoot for the cotton industry. The Northern Territory government a few months ago announced that it would support uh, an agribusiness strategy that could see 100,000 hectares of cotton and uh, the uh, facilitation and declaration of policies uh, to extract water, uh, surface water, to facilitate this industry. We also have the uh, extraordinary, extraordinarily large uh, proposal to frack uh, the Beedaloo Basin, which could see up to 6,000 wells drilled into an aquifer that discharges and keeps rivers like the Roper River and the Daly River flowing through the dry season. These industries and climate change could have a profound impact on our water. And we know that there are decisions in the pipeline that uh, could have devastating impacts on our rivers and waterways. I'm not going to talk for much longer. I'm now going to pass over to our experts who have been closely analysing and researching water systems in the Northern Territory, uh, some for many decades, some more recently. And they will help make sense of some of the recent decisions and decisions which are proposed to open up our rivers and aquifers for, for large large scale industry um, and will demonstrate some of the considerable legal, scientific and, and policy flaws underpinning these decisions. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to now introduce our first speaker, Professor Sue Jackson, who is from Griffith University and has a long history here in the Northern Territory. Um, I'll ask her to introduce herself and speak uh, speak first. Thank you. Sue, you're on mute. Had to be one, the first one. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners in the room in Catherine, 
uh, many of whom I've worked with over the years, and also the traditional owners of the lands of the Melbourne region, the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nation, where I'm currently based. I'm really sorry I couldn't be there today, um, but it's lovely to see... Peter Martin. Join the meeting. It's lovely to see a packed room full of uh, enthusiastic people. Um, so some of you know that before I joined the Australian Rivers Institute, I worked at CSIRO in Darwin, where I studied for many years under the, um, uh, under the supervision of traditional owners from the groups that are there in Catherine and elsewhere, and researched the importance of water to your communities um, and, and wider communities throughout North Australia. And it's this I want to be focusing on today. And I want to be focused also on um, some of the management processes and how they're considering the issues that are so important to you. Um, the first thing I should do is um, just for the benefit of people who um, aren't familiar with the region is to um, just got to get the slideshow moving. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get the controls working. There we go, the map. Um, this is a map of the Roper catchment, which um, shows all the areas, the land that drains into the Roper River, the actual river. Uh, but because we're talking about um, a subtropical climate where we have a very distinct dry season, many, many months with it, with little rain or any, um, the surface water availability is very limited. And so to really understand the water story in this region, and how the Roper River flows, the other rivers that in this region flow during the dry season, you need to be thinking about the groundwater flows. And as many traditional owners have said, they've told us and scientists are more recently coming to understand, there are significant connections between the groundwaters and the basins underlying this region, and also many strong connections between the groundwater and the surface waters. And Matt's gonna be talking more about that issue later this afternoon. And Kirsty's talked much about how important these are to all peoples in the community in this region. So within the area that could be affected by water resource development, there are probably about 20 to 30 traditional owner groups. And um, as many of you have, have said to, to us and to others, you're very concerned about the impacts of water resource development. And you stress in, um, in comments to the public and in submissions to government, the connections between land and water, connections that are maintained by customary tenure, connections that are maintained by, established by religious beliefs and maintained by cultural practices. And we know also that traditional owners have accumulated environmental knowledge of the region over hundreds of generations and share rights and responsibilities to country, both land and water, as well as to other communities that are linked through shared waters. So, as pressure to use water increases in this area, what do governments, developers, and those who are concerned about country need to know? What information will help governments to make careful decisions? And for people who are worried about country, who care for country, to know that those decisions will protect it. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to outline the questions, questions that should be answered before major decisions are made and comment on how well they've been addressed. So the very first thing we need to know and the fundamental thing is what is at stake? What matters to Indigenous communities of this region? How and why is water so important? And traditional owners have been explaining the critical importance of water and country for many years. And you've done that in many different ways, in many forums and in many formats. Here's a beautiful picture of the uh, map that recently went to Canberra, trying to convey how critical water and water flows are to culture, to community and country. Traditional owners have also shared a lot of information with researchers, and we now have several publications that can be used in, uh, in, making, in informing decisions about water use. Uh, we have a reasonable understanding of the importance of water in the Daly and the Catherine and the Roper areas. We have no published studies for the region south, which is where the Georgina Wiso water allocation plan um, covers. So that is a real gap that we have at the moment. We know from the research and from the voices of traditional owners that water is a sacred and element source of life. The values are very consistent across the region. 
the life that water sustains is a part of a wider system of interconnected social and physical relationships. Water is critical to Indigenous identity. In this region, as with the rest of inland Australia, the availability of water shaped the movement of people and rich complex cultural waterscapes were constructed around spiritually powerful water bodies created by ancestral beings. As the war world attained the shape that it has through the actions of these beings, cultural institutions were formed and these define people's ancestral rights, interests and responsibilities. And it is from this basis that Indigenous peoples tell us that they have an expectation to be involved in water management and water governance. In our research along the ROPA, we were told of how people conceive of and use water as a way of creating relationships, connections, and also establishing boundaries, as this quote from the Wawaloan people illustrates. We are upstream, we are at the point of origin. We are guardians for the downstream people and they are the guardians for us. The LC mob are getting us involved because we are upstream. They've got the underground water for us and we've got the surface water for them. The ownership of two go hand, goes hand in hand. So people saying here and stressing the critical need to make decisions about water together. And this is why we see such a big group of people organised here to, to listen to this webinar and meet and to discuss the water issues that you're confronting. We're also told of the critical importance of water for country, how people are concerned, desperately concerned about maintaining water for country. And water for country here encompasses water in the springs, the rivers, the water holes, water at important dreaming sites, dreaming places, water for plants and animals, but also water sufficient to maintain ongoing practices like fishing and hunting. This is very important for the customer economy. So we have two environmental management processes that have been running for the last five years, the last five years or so. We have the baseline impact study, the SREBA, that came out of the PEPA inquiry, the fracking inquiry. And we also have the Georgina Wiso Water Allocation Plan which recently was declared and also allows for a very large amount of water to be used by industry. So an important question for this meeting and for others in the coming months will be, how well do these environmental management processes address the questions that need to be answered? Both these, in my view, both these processes have left us all with many unanswered questions and are quite flawed in terms of managing the risks that may occur from water resource development. So looking at other critical questions, aside from the basic question of how important is water to traditional owners and other indigenous communities of, of the region. The second question is a question that has to be answered and, and it needs to be answered before water resource development dramatically increases. How might water resource development affect country and culture? Now, this will require that we have very close and careful studies done in collaboration with traditional owners, done under conditions of trust and respect, where we can all gain a clearer understanding of the important places. Where are they in the landscape? Where do people visit? How often? How do water flows maintain these places and the values that um, are sustained by flows of water? What might actually change with water resource development and by how much? How, will this change be considered by traditional owners to be acceptable? Will it be okay or won't it be? These are only questions that can be answered by careful research done under the right conditions. There are other critical questions about how the management system, the water allocation planning system, for example, is to address um, the critical need to care for country. How can places, values and relationships be maintained? Who should make decisions about protecting water and culture? Who decides whether those changes are acceptable or not? And who needs to be involved in ongoing manage management, in the monitoring, in the caring for country and how can those groups be supported? 
So I want to turn now to whether the fracking studies that have just come out answer these questions and then the water allocation plan, whether that does. So the Pepper inquiry recommended safeguards and further studies. It specifically recommended that there be a comprehensive assessment of the cultural impacts of any gas industry development and that this needed to be completed prior to the grant of approvals. Well, that study came out this year and it is inadequate to the task of addressing the questions that I've outlined here. It only covered part of the Beetaloo. By its own admission, there was not enough time for a full discussion of water values. COVID interfered in the program to some extent, but there also wasn't the trust established to conduct the research. And many people felt that they'd not been consulted properly. So as a result, that study really doesn't do much more than the previous studies that reminded that, that confirmed how important water and water places are to country and culture. It's not able to answer the questions about the specific impacts of water resource developments or how those might be managed into the future. Now, it's not only my opinion or the opinion of other water experts that that study can't do the job. It is also the opinion of David Ritchie, who is the ind independent uh, overseer. He's the Northern Territory officer who was charged with um, oversighting the implementation of the Pepper inquiry and the reports. And in May this year, he concluded that that social and cultural study is not the comprehensive assessment of the cultural impacts recommended by the inquiry. He said it has not mitigated and does not purport to mitigate risks to Aboriginal people and their culture. These risks, he concluded, remain at an unacceptable level. Now, that is a very concerning conclusion that, in my view, hasn't received enough public attention. So the second, the second process that we have underway here is the Georgina Water Allocation Plan. Now, as I mentioned, that has allocated a substantial amount of water for industry. So does that answer these questions that have to be addressed if we are to be satisfied that country and culture can be protected? Well, it, in the first instance, it didn't involve any Indigenous people or any other stakeholders in setting the scope of the plan or in identifying objectives for the plan or in identifying places of importance or in discussing risks to places of importance or how those should be managed. Now, this is quite a stunning development in my opinion. Uh, I'm not aware of any water allocation plan in the rest of Australia that has not involved a stakeholder advisory committee in its development, nor one that is so, has so clearly excluded Indigenous people. It has also fundamentally failed to mitigate risks by not preparing the information, not gathering the information and analysing that information before very important decisions were made. It proposes to set up an Aboriginal reference group in the future. It proposes to identify cultural sites in three or four years time, not before the water resources can be allocated to industry. It also proposes to do other studies of social and cultural values for the non-Indigenous com community. It has not done that research before the decisions are made. It proposes that monitoring will be undertaken, but not now in a, a few years time. It is quite possible that we could see detrimental impacts before any of these steps are taken. So for those reasons, I think it's set a precedent in Australia for a very poor standard of water planning. It's out of step with national water, water policy that expects Indigenous peoples to be involved. It expects the cultural objectives to be identified, expects that conservation objectives will be identified. And it hasn't answered the critical questions that I've outlined previously. Now, I want to leave you again with just the last with comments from the independent officer from David Ritchie. I know it's a long quote, but it's worth understanding and appreciating. He says, the fact that regional water advisory committees have not been appointed for the areas where the onshore gas industry plans to expand their operations has reinforced the perception held by many Aboriginal people in affected communities that the traditional significance of groundwater has been ignored by government and, and industry. The inadequacy of meaningful engagement with Aboriginal people in remote communities about their traditional concerns 
has continued to draw both condemnation and calls for remedial action by governments. So these, some of these kinds of condemnation and calls for remedial action have come from water experts. You'd be aware that myself, Erin and Matt are part of a group of um, approximately 20 water experts around the country that have been writing to the Chief Minister and writing to the Federal Minister. And we plan to continue to be involved in um, trying to improve the situation that you all face. So thank you very much for your time today. I can hear everyone clapping next door. Thank you so much, Sue. Uh, that is a stark story indeed. Um, it's quite gobsmacking when you see it written up in that way. And we will uh, make time for questions at the end of this. Um, but first, I'm going to pass to Dr. Erin O'Donnell uh, to talk about the context of water planning policy and law in the Northern Territory. Thank you, Erin. Thank you very much, Kirsty, and thank you, Sue. That was excellent. Um, I'm just going to share my slides, and hopefully that's all coming up now. So my name is Dr Erin O'Donnell. I'm at the University of Melbourne. I've worked in water law and water policy for the last 20 years. Um, I have been working mainly remotely when it comes to the Northern Territory, although I did get up there this year to, to meet everybody at the fabulous conference that ACNT held in, in Darwin. Um, I will also begin by acknowledging that I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and I acknowledge that, like you in the room up there, they have never ceded their rights to care for the lands and waters on which I make my home. I also will stand in solidarity with the genocide that we are all witnessing right now and acknowledge the extraordinary solidarity that Indigenous peoples everywhere are expressing to the people of Palestine and Gaza. I stand against anti-Semitism in all its forms, but we need to acknowledge the colonial reality and the genocide that we are witnessing in the global scale right now. So let's get to the Northern Territory. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the water laws and build on what Sue has just said to talk about their inadequacy. Water law and water allocation planning in the Northern Territory has been described by the Environmental Defenders Office as the poorest in the country. Just going to let that sink in for a moment because that is an important thing to remember. Um, there are so many elements of the Northern Territory's water laws that could position them ahead of the curve and yet somehow they remain well behind. So we'll talk a little bit about why, why that happens and what that causes. We'll also talk about the Aboriginal Water Reserve. This is genuinely something that could position the Northern Territory ahead of the curve but at the moment it simply does not. The first challenge and one of the big reasons why the Northern Territory water laws are described as being so poor is the absolute paucity of water allocation planning. So this is a map and I've, I've added the recent Georgina Wiseau um, area to it. So please forgive me if I'm getting that a little bit wrong. The, the GIS on that is basically me having a go. So if it looks like it's sitting over not quite the right area, that's on me. Um, but you can see there that water allocation planning covers about 30% at most of the Northern Territory, that is well out of step with the rest of Australia where it's more like 80%. So the reason why this matters is that the only places where we know, or where we at least have some data, um, for knowing what a sustainable extraction limit is, how much water can be sustainably extracted, um, what the impacts are of water resource management, where there are rules in place to try and manage those impacts and mitigate those risks that Sue was just talking about, the only places in the Northern Territory where any of that is in place is in those water allocation plan areas. And so the vast majority of the Northern Territory doesn't have any of those protections. We'll talk a little bit about how inadequate some of those protections are even once they're in place. But at a ground level, we can see that across the board, water allocation planning needs to be far more widespread across the Territory. When we think about what happens then when you actually go to the process of issuing a water license. As I said, most of the area in the Northern Territory doesn't have a water allocation plan. So decisions about what about whether licenses can be issued are made on the basis of assumptions, on modeling, on very, very poor data. Um, in many cases, licenses aren't issued at all. There are significant unlicensed water volumes that persist across the Northern Territory, particularly in the case of mining. So a lot of those 
uh, mining concessions were issued with the ability to use water, but that hasn't been formally integrated within the Northern Territory water planning processes. They haven't got licenses and we simply don't know the volumes. There is a process now underway as a result of recent legal reforms to try and bring that into the licensing framework, but it's a grandfathering process. And so yet again, we are not doing any of the environmental impact assessment, any of the analysis to try and understand whether or not those mines should have access to that water. It's just a kind of best guess estimate from the mine about what they've actually been using. Building on what Sue has said, what actually is sustainable and how do we know? When we look at the Georgina Wiso plan, for instance, we can see that they, there is an average recharge volume that people have relied on in setting an estimated sustainable yield. That average is only met or exceeded six times in the last 50 years. When we look at the information provided in the background report, you can see that there are very, very large but extremely infrequent recharge events. And so that makes an annual average pretty meaningless. So the idea of what is sustainable and how do we know that is contested and poorly understood. When licenses are issued inside water allocation plan areas, the limits set by the water allocation plan are a consideration. The water controller has to take it into account, but it's not actually a legal limit on how much water can be taken out. And as I said before, they still don't cover the vast majority of the Northern Territory. Plan boundaries can be really arbitrary. And this picks up on something that Sue was talking about before. When you look at the Roper catchment, for instance, you can see that there is a surface water drainage area. There are multiple contributing aquifers, particularly as you head south, and those aquifers interact. So trying to establish a water allocation plan boundary around one particular aquifer, like the Mataranka region, for instance, or the Georgina Wiso basins, how do you manage the cumulative effects between those aquifers when they are treated as separate entities? There might be very small, potentially, although at this point we don't really know, as Sue's indicated, impacts of water moving through those systems. But if there are very small impacts repeated across every single contributing and interacting aquifer, then you could end up with very significant impacts by the time this reaches the surface water at the Roper or any of the springs and sacred sites which are dependent on those groundwater flows. Licensing decisions are often inconsistent. We see different rules being applied. We've got the Singleton license. We've got other licenses that have been repeatedly contested in court. Um, and that's because licensing decisions are often made a little bit on the fly. They tend to be very large, particularly most recently, um, and without adequate supporting information to really know that there is a sustainable arrangement around how much water is actually being extracted. Cultural values are treated separately to the Aboriginal water reserve. So although significant volumes of water may be set aside in some instances for access under the Aboriginal water reserve to support economic development, this water is not available to support and maintain the cultural values or ecosystem values that depend on water. So when we look at then the Aboriginal Water Reserve and how that's shaping up, this is an example obviously that comes from the Georgina Wiso. We can see um, that it's dependent on those little hashed areas that you can see um, in that overall map. So in the Georgina system, there's about 10% of the land area is classified as eligible land, which makes it eligible to receive an Aboriginal water reserve volume. Um, in, the, in the Wiso Basin, it's about 17.5%. And that's reflected in how much water is actually available. But you can see there that that's a teeny tiny fraction, right? That's 10%, it's 17.5% 17 of the total volume that is available for everybody else to use. So Aboriginal people, traditional owners, you've never ceded your rights to this water. All water is Aboriginal water, and yet, in these instances, you are being limited in how much water is being set aside for your economic development on the basis of arbitrary decisions on what, what counts as eligible land. And of course, in many other parts of the Northern Territory, the Aboriginal Water Reserve is essentially meaningless. In many, many other plans, there are there's zero water available, even though a nominal value has been set in the plan, there's actually no water available. Um, the Ulu Dollarstone Aquifer, which is one of the most recently issued before Georgina Wiso, 
um, has recently been upgraded. Um, there's now more water available, but still zero available in the Aboriginal Water Reserve in the northern part of that plan. So even when water is set aside nominally for Aboriginal people to use, it does, there's no guarantee that that water is actually provisioned and available for access. When it comes to actually accessing that, that water as well, this is where the legal system lets itself down. And these, this, these challenges to accessing the Aboriginal Water Reserve are the reason why this idea, which is not in place in most other places in Australia, in most other places in Australia, um, traditional owners are desperately trying to claw back water from other users. It's already been fully allocated. So this was a step by the Northern Territory government and attempt to try and allocate this water in advance so that Aboriginal people were at least able to access some of the water for economic development before it had all been given away. But the, the challenges to accessing it and the fact that water is still not actually available in most of those water allocation plans and the Aboriginal Water Reserve doesn't exist without a water allocation plan, so it's not available in most of the Northern Territory anyway, means that it really falls short of those intentions. So we've talked about water availability. The estimated sustainable yield uncertainty becomes a problem here as well. So Sue's talked about the fact that environmental and cultural values that define sustainable yield in the Georgina Wiso, for instance, will not be known until 2028, but licenses will be able to be issued well in advance of that. So for people who wish to use the Aboriginal Water Reserve, you as traditional owners need to be able to feel confident that your water that you're using for economic development purposes is also sustainable, that you're not taking water away from the sites that need it, from all of the other, the, all of the other values in this location. And you can't have that certainty right now. The plan simply doesn't give you the information that you need. The next step is actually getting water into Aboriginal control. So what does it mean to issue a licence? This is an extremely complicated process. You have to know an awful lot about exactly where you're going to use this water, how you're going to use this water. Um, there is an opportunity to enter into an agreement with uh, non-Indigenous organisations um, and potentially lease the Aboriginal Water Reserve through this process. But again, that's a really complicated process. In the Georgina Wiso, for instance, where there is such a large volume of water that's now been made available for consumptive use, there is a genuine question about whether or not anybody would actually pay to use water from the Aboriginal Water Reserve. So what would be the potential benefits? for Aboriginal people in these circumstances. Next is the fact that we still don't know what the regulations are that the Act requires. So Section 71BA of the Water Act 1992 in the Northern Territory requires that the Aboriginal people who need to give consent for use for water under the Aboriginal Water Reserve be defined in regulation. Those regulations do not exist. So at the moment, even if you have water available under an Aboriginal water reserve, you are a traditional owner with eligible land and you can apply for that license and you issue, you get your license application in, you still can't actually be issued that license because there's no way to comply with those consent processes under the law because those regulations don't exist. Now, if we've got anybody in the room who um, knows better than that and has more recent information on the status of those regulations, I really welcome their input. But that is a major stumbling block. Even after the settler state law has gone through, then there are the challenges of making culturally appropriate and consistent decision-making processes about the way that the Aboriginal Water Reserve can be used. Um, a lot of work was done with traditional owners in the Ulu Dollar Stone, but that goes back over 10 years now. Uh, we haven't seen similar kinds of investment or conversations with traditional owners about how you want to make those decisions and about how you want to involve different people in those decisions. And of course, once you've come up with those things, then you need to put in place those new governance arrangements to give effect to those cultural, um, culturally appropriate decision-making processes. So overall, uh, water law in the NT lags everywhere else in the country. Um, and even things like the Aboriginal Water Reserve that should be a significant step forward are unreliable at best and basically unworkable. I'm gonna stop there and hand over to Matt. Thanks so much, Erin. Um, another dire picture. And now over to uh, Professor Matthew Carell to, to talk about the scientific basis um, and shortcomings thereof. 
for decision making about water in the Northern Territory. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, can you see my screen slides okay and hear me all right? We can't see your screen, your slides. Um, okay, we'll try that again. Try that again and I can share if needs be. There we go. They're coming. Looking good. Okay. So um, thanks for having me at this um, really important event on an incredibly important topic. Um, and um, a special um, thanks to Kirsty for organising this event and, and bringing everyone together. I'm, I'm so impressed by the turnout. I can see out there in um, my little window showing your, your room there at Environment Centre NT. So um, thank you. Um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge today that I'm joining from the unceded lands of the Turrbal and Yuggera people um, uh, in Mianjin, or now known as, as Brisbane. Pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that acknowledgement to all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, here on the call today. Um, so I think we've already heard, you know, Sue and, and Aaron would have covered um, quite comprehensively that um, there is a new water allocation plan, the Georgina Wiso uh, water allocation plan that's been declared recently, uh, a month or so ago. It covers a pretty significant area um, of the territory between around Daly Waters down to, to Tennant Creek and covers two major groundwater um, sub-basins within an aquifer system called the Cambrian Limestone Aquifer, um, a very important groundwater resource that sustains um, lots of values. Um, as Erin mentioned, this plan includes an estimated sustainable yield uh, which provides a kind of a cap um, on the amount of groundwater that can be extracted from this system um, over the next um, eight or nine years. And that um, estimated sustainable yield has been set at a value of 210 gigalitres per year, 210,000 megalitres per year, which is a very significant volume um, of groundwater. If that full estimated sustainable yield were to be utilised by industry extracting um, within that um, cap, we'll call it, it would actually increase extraction rates on the existing rates by about 14 times um, in this area. Um, so we're talking about a really big um, potential increase in, in groundwater extraction. And we've seen the interest from um, agriculture as well as oil and gas industries in um, basing expansion of their industries on, on extraction of groundwater in these areas. Um, I just want to put this map in here to, to again highlight that point and reiterate what Erin was saying about cumulative impacts. Um, the Cambrian Limestone Aquifer, which is shown here with the red outline here, is actually a very large and very interconnected aquifer system that covers more than just the area of the plan. Um, so, you know, the plan area here is sort of outlined in, in blue, um, but you'll see that the groundwater that's flowing within the Cambrian Limestone Aquifer is connected all throughout this zone um, that's outlined in red here. And the water tends to flow from these southern areas um, around the sort of Tennant Creek and the arid zone um, up to the north to um, areas like Mataranka, Roper River, Flora River, those really important um, river and spring systems. Um, so how is this estimated sustainable yield arrived at um, within this water allocation plan? It is still um, a little bit unclear. It's not actually specifically stated what the criteria was or were that allowed the Northern Territory Government to arrive at this figure of 210 gigs per year. Um, as Erin mentioned, um, you know, there's been some estimation of recharge um, to the aquifer system that naturally occurs through rainfall. Um, that average recharge, uh, which is a sort of a yearly rate, um, hides the fact that recharge in this area to replenish the groundwater system is highly, highly variable through time. And, and in the majority of years, there's little or no recharge actually happening because of the, the high level of aridity. Um, so, so replenishment of the aquifer depends on these really big rainfall events that are quite rare and may only happen um, once in a decade or once every few decades. Um, and I guess the key consequence of that or the key implication for sustainability is that extraction at that allowed rate, the estimated sustainable yield, is very likely to actually exceed the recharge um, in most years. Because um, as you'll see on the, uh, the supporting information that was in the plan, um, it's really, you know, there's only a handful of these events that significantly replenish the, the aquifer system. We also have a bit of a problem in that the observation data from those large episodic recharge events um, is pretty patchy at best. 
Um, there's not really any monitoring data to, to verify what the level of recharge was, for example, in 1974, which is this, this huge um, inferred recharge event that, that's, that's in the modelling. Um, only a couple of bores have really captured what happens when we do have those, those major climatic events. So I would take this um, sort of average recharge estimate with, with a fair grain of salt. Um, okay, um, when we're talking about sustainable extraction of groundwater, it's really important just to have a little bit of basic um, theory on how aquifers respond to the extraction of, of groundwater. Um, so you know, under normal sort of circumstances where we're not taking water out of our aquifers, um, we can assume that the recharge coming into the groundwater system is approximately balanced by what we call the discharge coming out of the aquifer system. And that is flow of water that is going to things like streams that are groundwater dependent, um, springs that, that depend on the flow from that aquifer, um, and the use of the groundwater by like vegetation communities that are, that are taking the water out. Um, there are actually three really important effects that can occur and usually do occur in some combination if we start to pump groundwater out of that aquifer system. One is that we remove groundwater from storage and start to drop the groundwater levels within the aquifer. I think this is the, the effect that has been sort of most discussed and most emphasised, uh, particularly when, you know, members of the Territory Government and the Water Department have been talking about this plan. They keep trying to contrast the volume of water that's in the plan against the total storage that's in the aquifer and maybe highlighting that, well, that's actually a small volume. It's 2 or 3% or something like that, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, this ignores the two other really important effects of groundwater extraction uh, when we start taking water out. When we take water out from the groundwater system, that water is always flowing and it's connected with the hydrological cycle and it's going towards the discharge areas, things like those springs and, and streams. So a key effect of extracting groundwater, uh, particularly in the long term, is that we start to capture flows of water that would otherwise come out at the surface and support those really important sites and ecosystems, things like springs. Um, the other is that we can actually start to increase the amount of water that enters the groundwater system at the recharge end of the system. Um, so inducing capture of surface water that, that would otherwise be runoff and bringing that down into the ground instead. Um, and so all of these three things need to be really strongly considered when we're coming up with the definition of what is a um, sustainable rate of groundwater extraction. And I think in the background information for this particular plan, there really has not been anywhere near enough emphasis on particularly these last two criteria um, when we're looking at sustainable extraction. So, um, the Cambrian Limestone Aquifer is a highly connected aquifer system, so flows within the Georgina Basin and the Wiso Basin do connect with the Tyndall Limestone Aquifer in the Daly Basin further to the north. Um, this has been shown through some really important work done by um, ecologists who have basically shown that there is connectivity within the groundwater ecosystem. Um, within what we call the Steiger fauna that actually inhabit the, the subterranean spaces in the aquifer. So the, the diversity and the patterns of these um, organisms are showing a really high level of connectivity between the basins. Um, we know that the Tyndall limestone sustains really important river flows. So the ropa, um, the flora are very, very um, strongly supported by groundwater flows uh, from the Cambrian system. And so increasing the extraction from the Georgina and Wiso basins will reduce to some extent the through flows of water from the south that do make it up to the north into the Daly Basin and up towards those rivers um, where the groundwater is sustaining the, the river flows. Um, this has still been pretty poorly quantified, I would say, in the modelling. And unfortunately, we're not in the background report for this plan and the others, given a really clear um, you know, step-by-step -step process of how that modelling has been done, what assumptions have been made, where some of the uncertainties might be. Um, something that's probably, you know, a, a significant concern from my point of view is that, you know, this is the area I'm just highlighting here where that Georgina Basin and the Wizzo Basin start to connect up with the, um, with the, the Tyndall limestone further to the north, which is sustaining the Ropa and the Flora River systems. Um, potentially, we will have quite concentrated extraction happening in these areas of the plan, uh, more so than further to the south. And so potentially the consequence is really affecting those through flows that are going between um, the different parts of the aquifer system, which as these arrows are showing, are, 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 you know, directly flowing towards the Roper and the Flora River. 
Um, and just trying to put that into cartoon format. So I've got kind of two pictures, one at the top, uh, which represents the, um, the Tyndall limestone near the Mataranka Springs and, and the Roper River. You can see that under sort of natural conditions, you have a water table with groundwater flows going towards the river and the springs. Um, and probably some kind of threshold level to maintain the discharge of groundwater to the springs. If we then start extracting groundwater, we'll bring the level of the groundwater um, down. Even if the flow direction is still going towards the springs, we'll be reducing the rates or the flux of, of groundwater flow towards the river um, and the springs. Under an extreme case, if we were to allow, say, 80% depletion of storage within the aquifer system, um, which you know, would be in line with the current arid zone rules that are used um, in some cases. Um, we would actually reverse the direction of flow back from the river and the springs back in towards the aquifer and cause those springs in the river to, to dry out. Um, looking down in the Georgina Basin, uh, again, I'm just looking at this interface area between where the Georgina flows to the Daly Basin. Currently, we have flow coming from the south upwards towards the north. Uh, but if we start to extract groundwater, we're going to bring down the level of the, of the aquifer um, in this interface zone. We reduce the through flow that's going into the north to sustain what's going on in the daily basin. If that's really intensive localised extraction, you know, for example, in the northern part of the plan area where most of the infrastructure is, there's a danger that you draw down the groundwater more significantly. And again, you can have a reversal of that flow direction. So instead of the Georgina Basin replenishing and sustaining flows in the Daly Basin up towards the Roper and the, and the Flora Rivers, we then start to have that direction of flow reversed and the Daly Basin flow is going back in towards the, the Georgina. Um, I think the estimates of groundwater through flow, which have been put in the background report, um, are said to be based on the modelling, the Northern Territory Government's groundwater modelling. Um, again, I think really there's not a whole lot of really strong supporting evidence to actually verify those rates of through flow. Um, so, you know, I think this is a really critical scientific knowledge gap that needs to be addressed. We need to know how this level of extraction, which is considered sustainable, um, may impact on that through flow of groundwater between the different basins with big implications for groundwater dependent streams and, and rivers and springs. Um, the, the, the plan itself, again, sort of does some estimating of will there be impacts on groundwater dependent vegetation and other ecosystems within the plan area. A lot of the assumptions around uh, a lack of likely impact from extraction on these ecosystems, um, as it's explained in the report, is based on water table depth mapping. And so there is this map included in the background report for the plan, which shows that the depth to groundwater is estimated to be, you know, pretty deep beyond sort of 40 or 50 metres in large parts of the plan area. Um, so the, the NT government has assumed that this means that there aren't ecosystems that are at risk of extraction because they're not going to be dependent on groundwater because the groundwater already is so deep in the system. Um, however, when you look sort of drill into the database that's actually used to develop this, um, there are certainly areas on the edges of the basin uh, where the water table is much shallower and we may have groundwater dependent vegetation communities as well as some of the springs that have been mapped. Um, and the kind of ground truthing of both the water levels and the potential dependence of um, vegetation and other ecosystems on groundwater is, is patchy. And as Sue has mentioned earlier, um, it's something that's kind of planned in the implementation phase of the plan, not done upfront beforehand to ensure that we know what the impacts on, on ecosystems will be. So there's some ground truthing work that hasn't been done and that isn't proposed until after the plan commences. So just quickly, a few more knowledge gaps, just sort of stepping the lens out. Um, ACNT actually commissioned uh, myself and my colleague Chris here to do a bit of a review of the Streber studies, which were associated with the fracking inquiry. And we identified some other really important knowledge gaps, particularly understanding of the connectivity between deep aquifers, such as those targeted by the oil and gas industry and the shallower overlying aquifers um, in the Beetaloo region. So I don't think that, that connectivity is really well established not to the extent that we can know what the effects of you know, extracting significant volumes of water and oil and gas will be. And then also the extent of groundwater discharge from deep levels to the surface. There's been observation of um, you know, gases um, within certain springs, particularly in this Hot Springs Valley discharge area, which imply that you can actually have deep groundwater flows um, coming up to the surface in certain areas um, around the edges of the, of the Cambrian system. Um, but again, that's really poorly quantified. It's hardly been studied. Uh, we don't really have any data um, on those on those springs um, within these three studies. So I think the idea that um, you know the the science has 
you know, been completed or the recommendations of that pepper inquiry into fracking have been fulfilled as, as the Territory Government has been sort of saying in public, um, I think we need to look at that really closely because it, it's not supported by a close analysis of all the, um, the data that's been produced. Um, so I might just leave it there. I just a little overlay there of the Beetaloo Basin area there and just highlighting the sort of areas that are at threat from increased extraction in the absence of a really strong scientific basis um, on impacts. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there and hopefully we've still got a bit of time for, for questions for everyone. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you to all of our speakers. Before I pass over, um, I'm going to go first to the room, and I have to say this wasn't organised by ECNT. It was organised by Dr Samantha Phelan from Protect Big Rivers, who's based in Catherine, totally amazing person there in the front of the room. <laughs> um, but I'll just, I mean, recap briefly in a pretty impoverished way the key messages that really have come home from me from your three presentations. And using the example of the Georgina Wiso Water Allocation Plan, which um, I think we were all quite shocked had been declared uh, just a few weeks ago, given the considerable concerns that were expressed by the community about it. Um, from Sue's presentation, I think that what's demonstrated is that that plan fell far short, falls far short of what is required under national uh, water policy, the National Water Initiative in particular, because of the way in which traditional owners, custodians of these water places were excluded from the development of that plan. Um, and that was one of the starkest um, components of that plan. And there were many traditional owners and groups across the Northern Territory last year who advocated for the establishment of those advisory committees and those calls went completely unheeded. Erin, uh, thank you so much for your very pithy explanation of all the numerous flaws in uh, water policy and law in the Northern Territory. And uh, again, it, it shows, I think, that the legal framework that we are using to base these decisions on is so flawed that really uh, there, there is very little capacity in the existing legal framework and policy framework to ensure protection of the uh, in environmental and cultural values uh, that are associated with these places. And lastly, Matt, um, thank you so much for your, your very careful work, uh, rigorous work over a couple of years now to identify what some of the very considerable gaps are in the evidence base underpinning these decisions. Um, in particular, I think that that diagram showing the quite catastrophic impacts if you do take too much water um, out of the aquifer that discharges into the ROPA and into the daily systems, um, that's something that has really resonated with people across the catchment. It's something that we discussed in the meeting this morning. And I think it shows that this is part of the picture of potentially dangerous decision making when there are such gaps in the evidence base, but we are pushing ahead with these decisions like the Georgina Wiso plan uh, uh, occurring. So that's my sort of quick uh, summary of, of uh, those presentations, but I might now pass over to Sam Phelan in the room, just to see if there are any questions from anyone in the room, uh, including from Sam herself, um, that uh, our experts can answer. You guys are on mute. Oops, 77 participants. Are you guys speaking there in the room? Because we can't hear you. They can't hear you. Someone's asking a question, I think. Mm. Oh, bugger. What a shame. Put your mobile phones out. Is 
So for those in the room, we actually can't hear you. So you could potentially come in here and ask a question. Um, I'm not quite sure how to troubleshoot that in there. She just did. I heard her say something. I have a question, she said. Apparently, you can't hear me now, but we definitely can't hear you in the room. You're all right. Here's Sam making a cameo. <laughs> Hello, folks. The question's from Winston Thompson, who is from Nooka, and he's just wondering legal ramifications and how legally binding implementation of PEPA is in regard to water. Thanks. Good question. Oh, no, she's disappeared. you got to go back and... I'm probably going to have a go at answering have that. Have a bit. go at that, Erin. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the PEPA inquiry established a series of recommendations that said that no fracking should commence until there is water allocation planning completed for the Beetaloo Basin. The reason why this matters is because the Northern Territory Government accepted those recommendations. Um, so they agreed that, yes, we will follow those recommendations of the PEPA inquiry and we will not do these things. We will not issue any licences to enable fracking um, or any other development to happen in the Beetaloo Basin until we have completed this water allocation planning process. So it's not so much a matter of being legally binding as a commitment that the government has made. Um, and that is one of the drivers for the fact that this plan was completed so quickly and therefore they didn't have time to fully, um, as Sue talked about, explore those cultural values and to establish a stakeholder reference group. I have a couple of questions uh, while the, we've still got sound issues in the room next door. Um, about the water trigger and there is a campaign that's currently on foot um, and it's being led by communities across the Northern Territory but backed in by a number of climate groups to get the water trigger established uh, under the EPBC Act or amended so that it applies to fracking. Um, what is currently being advocated for is that that change to federal law shouldn't happen uh, you know, in 18 months when the, the bigger piece of law reform happens, but it happens immediately. Um, and we're waiting to hear if that has been successful. But maybe Sue and Matt, I know you've got experience with the water trigger. How do you think that might help things here in the Northern Territory? Well, the point would be to give the Federal Minister a direct lever to become involved and to take account of what's going on here and hopefully establish um, closer dialogue with the Environment Minister in the Northern Territory and oversight. There's, not only do we have all the discussion about the water trigger being a lever, there's also the, the National Water Initiative, uh, which is now um, you know, nearly 20 years in um, being implemented and up for um, refresh or revision. So the federal government is committed to revising, refreshing, they call it, the National Water Initiative. And so in our commentary and our um, correspondence with the federal minister, we have been encouraging them to look very closely at what's happening in the Northern Territory to justify um, very strong intervention in up um, maintaining the standards, but also looking at whether the current national water policy is adequate. Um, the fact that it can be, it has been ignored, these kinds of breaches that we're talking about and failure to implement standards have been so far ignored by, the, by Commonwealth governments 
And the fact that that can happen does show a weakness in national water policy. National water policy used to be tied to funding. Implementation used to be tied to funding from the Commonwealth Government. Um, so there's a there's a need now to look at whether um, you know governments are willing to the federal government is willing to ensure that state and territory governments comply with the national water policy. Uh, so that's also another lever that the Commonwealth government um, has, and we would hope is willing to use as well as the water trigger. Now Matt's been working in Queensland. Um, more closely than I have, and so is aware of the the role the role of the trigger. And I'll just hand to him to comment there on um, groundwater issues. Yeah, thanks, Sue. Look, um, I guess from the scientific perspective, where the water trigger adds a sort of a level of of rigor is that there is an independent committee that's been established, mostly of academics who um, you know have backgrounds in hydrogeology, ecology, contaminants, these sorts of things. Now, with the water trigger, it means that any project that's put up for, um, you know, assessment, particularly in the sort of mining sector, oil and gas, and, and it would apply to shale gas in the NT, has to go through that committee and get the scrutiny and the advice from those scientists as to how well it's actually assessed its, its water impacts. Um, ultimately, the decision making is then still handed on to the ministers, um, both the, the federal and the state level. And in many cases, we've seen actually that committee, for example, with you know some coal, coal seam gas and coal mining projects in Queensland, the committee, the scientific committee points out some pretty serious deficiencies within the science in some of these projects. Um, often the loop isn't sufficiently closed so that water protections are put in place or those impacts are really understood. And there's pressure for ministers to go and approve those projects anyway. So it's definitely um, an important thing. It adds another level of scientific scrutiny. Um, but in terms of how much it's actually protected water resources or led to, you know, decisions that actually go in the direction of, you know, protecting the environment rather than prioritising oil and gas development, um, generally the decisions have been going the way of industry um, to this point anyway. Thank you. And I think that's a reminder to all of us that while the water trigger is something we're all advocating for uh, to apply to shale gas, it does not resolve all of these issues. <laughs> we are going to need to not just advocate for that, but um, advocate for uh, wholesale reform of the way that water planning and policy works in the Northern Territory and perhaps look at different ways of doing things here. Um, and I'll... Uh, go to the next question but at the end I will show some images of an incredible trip by Roper traditional owners last week which really resonated with politicians in Canberra and show that there's a potential to do things differently here in the Northern Territory from what's been done in other places in southeastern Australia. Um, I might just go now there's a question from uh Simone saying, do you have an estimate of what would be an appropriate estimated sustainable yield and how or how would you go about doing that? Yeah, I don't mind having a having a go at this one. Thanks for the question, Simone. Um, you know, it, it's difficult. We don't have the Northern Territory government's model at our fingertips to actually look at sort of the the different scenarios that that could be run. Um, as I've mentioned, we have some gaps in the actual um, you know the databases to understand these groundwater systems and and get a good handle on the effects of extraction at different rates. So in that kind of um, environment of having that scientific uncertainty, you know, cho choosing an, a sustainable yield that's at the much lower end towards, you know, similar to the current rates of extraction, if they want to increase levels of water extraction, fine, but do it in an incremental way and monitor the impacts of that incremental increase in, in you know, groundwater extraction, rather than what I think is proposed here is like a step change. So really go an order of magnitude kind of, um, you know, jump between the current extraction rates and the, you know, what's considered the sustainable cap. Um, it's just such a big increase, you know, that 14 times um, above the current sus sustainable, um, well, the, the current extraction rate. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. I have a very extraordinary person sitting next to me now, uh, Milawonga Warbin, uh, who has a question. Yes, question? I do have Thank a question. you. 
no longer. Um, the question is, I think one of you there mentioned the water policy. The water policy um, that has been uh, created by the anti-government. And also you mentioned that the, our people, the indigenous people, never had or ever informed or uh, being notified in advance of the water policy that includes on our land. So also, if we are to have um, a water reference group, indigenous reference group, uh, we are able to speak on behalf of our, our people. And not only that, but be part of the water policy that the government has at the moment. So how would we, all those people sitting up there, how would we all uh, come up with this to be able to work together as a team and to represent uh, the entire, you know, water basin and aquifers that, that the government are looking at into getting and destroying all their water, I guess. Thank you for that question. Um, I might make a comment based on some work that was done more than 10 years ago in the Daly region, mm -hmm. and then Erin might like to add something as well. But um, there's many people in the room, I'm sure, that remember the Daly River Community Reference Group. Uh, in the early 2000s, the Claire Martin government wanted to increase agricultural development in the Daly River. And there was um, only two people from the community put on a community reference group and all the traditional owners said that's not good enough where at that time there were 11 language groups in that catchment and so with by working with the land council myself and others um, we made the case for a, a community reference group that represented all of those traditional owner groups the community said we want to have two people and they said a man and a woman from each language group and we want some resources and we want the time to work together to meet and to come up with our own plan. And they did that over a number of years in around 2004, 2005, and made a very strong case for what they wanted to see happen in the catchment. So I think for um, the, the for the future, for the near, for right now and for the future, your strength lies in working with countrymen who have interest in and and who share these waters and shares share responsibilities and demanding of government the chance to get together and to work together to develop your own vision, your own statements, your own plans, and to, and to speak up for them strongly like many groups have been and saying that you're not going to agree with the way that government's doing this. It's not, it's not being done well at all. It's not in line with national policy. It's not in line with, the, with what a lot of Australians, I think, um, think should be a good standard of um, of involvement and should uh, and a high standard of protection. So I'd encourage you to to talk more with people from the Daily and from the Catherine and from other places about how you can all work together to be strong and and get support for the um, processes that you believe will give you an ongoing say. Erin, did you want to add anything you about that opportunities? It's the reason why I mentioned that is because um, part of our, our, you know, law that we have as indigenous people, I mean, we have water protocols as well that the government, you know, do not know of. Our water protocol, you know, states how sacred our water is and, and that it is alive, by the way. I mean, they need to understand that and come to a term where we're able to sit down and talk talk to them. And actually, water is free. We don't have we, we do not have to pay for our water. It has always been free, you know. And that's very sad that we are able to continue paying, you know, power and water when the water actually, you know, belongs to us. 
as well mm -hmm. as being given to us, you know, by by our Mother Earth and all of our creation of spirit beings that actually created all of this. We, we do have we do have stories to tell that they need to understand and the actual protocols of water, what we must do and what we must not do. We want people to listen to us, be able to understand how we are deeply connected, you know, not only with the water, but the entire environment, the plants and animals and everything, which we all work together. Mm. But thank you for that, yeah. Um, but I think that yeah. yeah, Catherine. You'd like to have them to Catherine? Yeah, you know, to bring all of the countrymen mm -hmm. sitting out there so um we can come up with with a yeah. with, with a plan, yeah. What a policy plan, but but a traditional one as well mm. that we can introduce to the government here, the NTW. Mm. I think you've just nailed it. Um, the idea of coming up with your own plan, mm -hmm. so you being resourced and then you telling government this is what you want. So the Northern Territory government is continuing to treat traditional owners as though you're just stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is the same thing that we hear from traditional owners across Australia. You are rights holders. You've never ceded those rights. You're sovereign people. And so what you're proposing to them is this is our plan the whole thing. This is what we think should guide the entire use of water in this catchment. This is how power should be shared. This is the way decisions should be made. Um, and this is what it means to understand the river. And so that's a very different thing from being invited to form a reference group or invited to contribute to an existing plan that the settler government is already doing their way. Yeah. Um, and so I think what you're describing is exactly the right way forward where it emphasizes your status as sovereign people and it says you've got laws and traditions and knowledge about the way water should be known and cared for and that should guide the entire framework for caring for that river system yeah thank you thank you so much i might pass now to jody uh, who had a wonderful question Okay, I'm really gobsmacked by the information that you have presented today. Um, the fact that the National Water Initiative was biased, um, it excluded traditional owners, um, the, there's no environmental assessment, the uh, legal framework is flawed, the PEPA inquiry, which is non-legally binding, only a, a recommendation, bias again. Um, the Regardless of that, the Northern Territory government says that the resources and minerals belong to them. That's utter garbage. This The water belongs to Aboriginal people, to Yapa. It belongs to the country. And um, these water licences, where on earth do they get the jurisdiction to issue these water licences on country that's not theirs? And surely this is in breach of a number of United Nations signatories. And surely we have, we, they, the, the Commonwealth of Australia has a duty of care to preserve our traditional way of life, to protect our wildlife and marine life. This is utter, this is just going to disturb that balance. I mean, surely they know that they cannot win this in court. And, you know, is that the only way to get them to listen to us? Is it the only way is to just pursue a, a case in court for a, um, the the um, lack of enjoyment and access to our sacred sites, our sacred um, springs to, it's gonna impact um, vegetation, it's gonna impact bush tucker, it's going to really disturb native way of life so is court the only answer here because they're excluding us and and uh my my fellow countrymen was just saying how can we make this make it be included in this how can we increase inclusion in these conversations at the decision ta table when it seems like oh no they shut the door on us so many times is court the only answer 
Well, thanks, Jodie. Look, I'm not in a position to offer legal advice. Um, and I mean, I, I'm sure that there are people in the room who are able to contact the Land Council or working closely with the with the land council and with representative bodies, um, native title bodies about the legal matters. As far as I understand from my interpretation of the Native Title Act, there isn't an opportunity to, um, well, water resource development proposals or projects do not trigger the future acts process. So I'm not sure that there are strong uh, grounds um, and I'm, as, as far as I know, the, the grounds are, are weak for pursuing um, any kind of justice under native title legislation. Yes, so we won't go it's... under native title legislation. All right, native title legislation is utter rubbish. Utter rubbish. It does yeah, not work so... in our best interest, and it's a racist act. I think that the strongest grounds for be, for making your case is through, um, you know, public commentary through lobbying of government through lobbying of the federal government in particular, um, but also building the alliances that you're doing with other residents and, and other groups in the region. Um, you know, everybody's aware of how important the Roper and the Springs and all of that country is to the tourism sector. It's vital to the pastoral industry. Um, all of the residents of Catherine um, and all the small towns, everybody, everybody understands how important these places are. I know a lot of white fellas don't stay around for very long. Some some do, but but a lot move on. But I think building alliances with those groups is very very important, and making the case for you know a wider public interest in in this region and in these issues and in healthy country and culture. Okay, what do you think about um, getting another independent state to sponsor us on the IJC? the International Justice, Justice Commission. Because I really think that if we keep pursuing domestic, 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 mm. we're just banging our head on the brick wall. We need mm. to go to the International Court of Justice. Well, there is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples makes very strong statements about rights to water, rights to, to participate in decisions affecting water, affecting people, affecting labour, uh, culture and livelihoods. So the, the UNDRIP is an important um, lever that potentially could be used in public debates. I understand the Commonwealth government's not required to, um, to implement it, but it has come up in recent um, amendments to the Murray Darling, to the Water Act in relation to the Murray Darling Basin. Um, UNDRIP's been introduced there as uh, a lever for in engaging with traditional owners in that region. So international law might be an angle yes I, I do recall reading a court case i cannot remember it was only just recent um that the, the judge's decision was because australia was a signatory to an international united nations um declaration or treaty that still it had a responsibility so in that case mm. the, the uh the the treaty that Australia was signatory to prevailed over domestic law. We've got Mari here too, who wants to. Yeah. What to say about but the Valley River Reference Group? Yeah, we've just we need got, to increase inclusion. We've got Mari uh, Alan, Alan here. Hello, Mari. <laughs> yeah, how are you, Sue? Good. How about you? Long time no see. <laughs> We're all a bit grayer now. I'm just saying, I was just going to ask Sue, first of all, how was the Daly River, why was it finally finished? Who stopped it? Uh, was it the NT government or how did it just uh, phase out, the Daly River Reference Group? Um, yeah, look, go I, think that, I think government stopped funding the meetings and stopped funding the process of getting people together. Um, I, I think that I'm not, it's a good, really good question. And I don't exactly know the full answer to that. Um, but they um, they seem to just sidestep the reference group and start, you know, started working more with the farmers um, and with the other, oh, with the yeah. irrigation sector. And it just kind of fizzled out and without, and without the support and resourcing it was hard to keep it going 
Um, but I think speaking to someone like Mona Liddy and some of the other members of the community reference group, we could find out what happened and whether there's anything to be learned from that time. I, I think these struggles really require a lot of pressure for a long, a long time, um, you know, decades really. Because what I'd like to say is I think the concept of the Daily River refer Aboriginal Reference Group was a good good um, concept, right? Because mm. it included all the Aboriginal people from the Catherine region, you know, the Jowan, the Waterman, the Wagaman, uh, all the way down towards the, you know, even the Mullock Mullock, all the way through to the hopefully, you know, not to the ocean, but certainly near there. And no, we did, all yeah. put it on there. And it was a good, it was a good group. I mean, I don't know what we've had really um, achieve in a big way, but uh, certainly there were some good ideas that came out of all our meetings in those days. Yeah, and well, that's... I think that they one, should use that. One of the problems with the way that water planning is going at the moment is Erin mentioned it, we've got groundwater plans and then we have... But then we have surface water areas and they don't link up. And so now we've got the Ulu plan relating to the central daily area, but it doesn't give opportunity for traditional owners down at the coastal side or up in the Catherine side to get together. So this is where we've got to be linking these interests and these um, relationships to water. We've got to link up people that speak for all of those places and see what water does and who it connects and how. Um, and that's the, the water plans don't do that at the moment. And they're run by um, water officials and scientists that don't spend enough time mm -hmm. listening to traditional owners about your way of understanding the way water behaves, how it flows, its, you know, its, its importance, uh, nor your responsibilities to to the to country in beyond these small places that might get a water plan for. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think that's the way to go, Sue, and I think that really I'm I'm all for establishing a, a reference group or even mm -hmm. even make it a bit more harder than a reference group. You know, someone that that we need to give it a bit of teeth. I think mm -hmm. a new group. Yeah. So I don't know what everyone else thinks, but that's my view. Okay. Needs big bloody teeth. Is that all right? Yeah. Great. Lovely to hear from you, Murray. Okay. Nice talking to you, Sue. I know that water maybe doing that water. Yeah, that's water. Yeah. Yeah. That's yours? Yeah. No, no. <clears throat> oh, we're just talking about all our water plants. That's yeah, the water yeah. 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 So did you want to say that? Yeah. So. I was here and my brother was here. Yeah. You've got to talk louder, Sue. You've got to talk louder, Sue. No, no, no. Oh, we're gonna, we're talking about yeah. the Daily River. Daily River. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, river. What you are. Daily River. Daily River. Yeah. Laura made up the Daily River. You know, for sunscreen. Yeah. It's good water. That's you know. I'm dizzy alone up with the floor and right you know, I don't know what we're going to do with the water for them. Yeah, we're going to think about it and plan. Yeah, we think about it and make a plan for them. Mm. And we'll have a talk. Okay. Well, yeah. Thank you, say. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. That's us from the Flora River. Yeah. Thank you, Mari. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's wonderful. Right. It's great. But I think that's the way to go. Yeah. yeah. We need exactly to set up something now. Yeah. To really. Uh, Hello, everyone. Um, so, we're just, we've been sort of going for an hour and a, a half now, and we might need to get close to wrapping up. Um, I know that I've got lots of questions here in the chat. What I might propose to do is to note those down and uh, then we will put them to the experts after this webinar and send them in an email to everyone uh, who has registered um, and also give people um, who are engaged in this some ideas for how they can become more engaged through the organisations that are working on water issues in the Northern Territory um, and to show solidarity and support for traditional owners 
who are clearly <laughs> wanting to be heard, to be engaged and to have their uh, decision-making processes and governance processes respected uh, far greater than they have been to date. Um, I might just pass to Sam Phelan quickly for a comment and then we'll wrap up. Thanks so much, everybody, for your knowledge and also thanks to everybody in this room today because it is really strong and it will only get stronger. I'm just wondering, though, from the experts, is there any sort of precedent? I mean, all of these things are obviously essential to happen if we are going to protect the Northern Territory as a place to live in with water. Is there the ability or a precedent that has overturned plans like this because it's kind of cut before the horse. If if this plan is enacted and licences are issued, the ability to pull back from this is obviously a very dangerous and tricky tightrope. And I'm just wondering, how do we stop it? I might pass to Erin to speak about the review processes for the under the Water Act, um, as limited as they are, but I think that's probably the first stop. Yeah, I think, look, it's, yeah, you could challenge the lawfulness of the plan. This is this is a ministerial decision to declare it. Um, you could try and mount an argument that it's so unreasonable that it is beyond power to be declared. These arguments are incredibly difficult to make um, and the chances of success are, are very limited. Um, and what you end up with is basically going back to have the minister remake what will undoubtedly be a very similar decision. Um, the plan itself does prescribe review processes as well. Um, so there are opportunities, obviously, to influence those. There are also opportunities to uh, challenge the licenses as they are being issued as well. Um, and so that is something, again, success has been mixed, but license decision-making has been successfully challenged in the Northern Territory, particularly for very large water licences. So that is another opportunity. Um, I think just this is a really hard thing to say, but I think you just got to keep turning up the heat. Um, this is something like if every licence decision under a plan like this becomes challenged, then that puts enormous pressure on the government. Um, the, the federal government needs to take much more responsibility here. They do have significant powers and they could be exercising them. There is a national framework that this plan is completely inconsistent with. So that national framework should be used to its fullest ability. The federal government should be stepping up and saying, you know, we have this plan, it, it needs to mean something. Um, there, are, there are opportunities to reset our relationships with rivers. Um, and I think one of the questions in the chat related to whether recognising the river as a person can change things. This is another long-term strategy. Um, it's, it's not going to deliver an immediate outcome, but changing the relationship between people and rivers is part of building that alliance that Sue was talking about across the whole community and saying enough is enough. We love our rivers and we're not going to let them disappear in front of our very eyes. And recognising rivers as living beings can be a way of getting there. Um, but this is, a, this is a difficult fight and there are no easy legal solutions. Jodie just wants to ask a quick final question and then we are going to have to wrap up. <laughs> okay, with the changes to legislation, the Water um, Resource Act or whatever it is, and all these policies that are coming in place to allow this fracking and cotton production, mass productions and all these sort of things. Surely we have a right to cancel all land use agreements and any other land uh, agreements, <clears throat> permits to our access to our country because of these changes. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's really a question for your communities and the and those that have signed the agreements. Um, you know, I don't think that's one that we should offer an opinion on because there's probably quite a bit at stake in in making a decision like that. Some of those agreements might be bringing other benefits that um, that you know we're not aware of. So, I, I, Jody, I just wouldn't like to comment on that. I'm sorry. I think it's an internal issue for your own communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jodie. Look, I am um, going to, to wrap up. I do want to just finish with a bit of a message of hope because um, actually what's happening 
here in the Northern Territory, got an incredible group of people sitting in the room next door to me, some of whom you've heard from, um, who are speaking up really strongly uh, in support of protection of rivers and aquifers and are being heard in places where they haven't been heard before and are, are speaking up really for recognition of their own governance processes. And last week, um, as was mentioned earlier, a group of traditional owners from uh, the Roper catchment visited Canberra and unveiled an extraordinary 13 metre map in Parliament House in the Mural Hall. And it was facilitated um, by a range of groups, but led by Territory Rivers, um, which is a campaign running in the Northern Territory um, to protect, protect our precious rivers. And at the end of it, I said to Naomi Wilfred, who is um, uh, pictured here, I said, how do you feel after this incredible meeting uh, where we had people like David Pocock, Federal Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek, uh, Federal Indigenous Affairs Minister Linda Burney, and of course, Malindiri McCarthy hosting the event, speaking in support and listening to people. And Naomi said, I feel really powerful. And that was the greatest endorsement of the entire trip. But it also, I think, showed that people did feel listened to in Canberra, perhaps in a way that they haven't uh, felt recently in the Northern Territory. Um, his, his former rugby captain, David Pocock, standing with Clive and Roland in the mural hall, um, Daphne Daniels and Clive there as well, Linda Burney speaking at the event, um, and Federal Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek, who is tasked with reforming water law and policy and uh, has does have a gaze on the Northern Territory and what's happening. Um, so with that, I, I'd like to just conclude uh, this event. I wanted to say thank you so, so much to Sue, Matt and Erin for your incredibly insightful and informative presentations. Thank you so much for your interest, your continued interest and commitment to water issues in the Northern Territory. We're immensely grateful for your expertise. And uh, thank you also to the incredible room of traditional owners, uh, rangers, people from across the Daly and Roper catchments who are here in the next room today, but also uh, traditional owners from across the territory who continue to um, look after and care for these very, very special places that we all need to be invested in speaking up for. So thank you again, and uh, we'll be in touch to everyone who registered with an answer to some of those questions and some suggestions for how you can show support and solidarity for what's happening here in the Northern Territory. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Please keep pushing the barrel. Really, thank you and love your work. Thank you. I'm just um, pushing people out. <laughs> <laughs>